Hey guys, this is Sergey, and you're watching Dissecting the Code. Today I want to show you that the finalizers are way trickier than you might think. They can cause crashes and very strange behavior if not used properly. Let's look at the code. Let's say that we want to create a very simple file copier. The constructor takes two paths, the source and the destination. We open file streams in the constructor, and then it has one single method copy async that calls copy2 to copy from the source to the destination. The class implements a disposable interface for eager resource cleanup. It also has the finalizer to make sure that the resources are cleaned up even when the dispose method is not called. Here is our dispose method, and we are disposing both a source and the destination. And here's how we're going to use our copier. We will create it in a using statement. We will call copy async, and that's it. And this is our main method that calls the copy method. Let's run and see what's going to happen. As you can see, the application crashes. We are running the finalizer, and finalizer crashes with null reference exception. So let's see why that happened. The finalizers are executed in a dedicated thread controlled by the garbage collector, like a regular thread, and an unhandle exception from the finalizer thread will cause the application to crash. Since there is a single dedicated thread to run all the finalizers in your application, it's also not a great idea to make blocking calls from it. And I don't even want to think about what strange things would happen in your application when the finalizer is blocked forever. Just don't call arbitrary code from the finalizers and don't allow exceptions to escape from it. And now let's look at why non-nullable reference types used in our case didn't help us to avoid null reference exception. As you can see, we enabled not nullable types here. But not nullable types are a purely compile time feature with some known restrictions, and the finalizers is one of them. Unlike C++ destructors, the finalizers can be called for partially constructed instances. It means that if the constructor of our copier fails with an exception, the finalizers is going to be executed. What it means? It means that if the exception happens during the destination construction, then the destination field will be null during the finalization. And the compiler doesn't know that. Inside the dispose method, the compiler thinks that the destination field is not nullable. But if this method is called from the finalizer, then the object invariance might not be true during this call. And it means that the source and the destination field might be null. We can fix this by using null safety operator. But a better option is not to dispose these fields when this method is called from the finalizer in the first place. There are two reasons why we should not touch the source and the destination field during the finalization. The order of the finalization is non-deterministic, and the finalizers are designed for cleaning up unmanaged resources, and the streams are managed resources. Again, if you have a C++ background, you might think that the order of the finalization is the opposite of the construction order. But this is not the case here. The CLR doesn't track the object's dependency chain and the construction order. It just registers all the instances in a global finalization queue. The queue has special treatment for critical finalizable objects and provides a guarantee that the finalization of normal objects happens before the finalization of critical objects. But there is no guarantee in which order the finalization happens within the normal or critical finalization segments of the queue. If a finalizable object A is referenced by a finalizable object B, the finalization for object A might happen before or after the finalization of object B. You just don't have the control over that. And we can even test that. Here's we have object A, which is finalizable, and object B that has a field of object A. And now we have an allocate method that allocates object B and calls GC collect. And we'll call this method multiple times. As you can see that in the first case, we constructed object A and object B, and then we call the finalizers for object B and then object A. But in the second case, the finalization order was different. First, we call object A finalizer and then object B finalizer. But the second aspect is even more important. Let's recap what's the differences between native and managed resources. Native resource is something like in pointer. When you wrap in pointer into a class, it becomes a managed resource. And the stream class is managed resource, so we should not have the finalizers in the first place. Let's look at another example. Let's say that we want to use RuxDB in our C Sharp application. RuxDB is written in C++ and you need to have an interrupt layer to use it in .NET application. So let's mimic this. Let's say that we have the static class that will expose a bunch of methods that we can consume to use it. We have createDB method to create a database. The method returns an opaque pointer. Then we have destroyDB that takes this pointer to close the database. And then we have useDB method that takes our handle. 
it traces the handle, it also traces whether the handle is correct, and then it calls the underlying native API. And instead of using InPointer directly, we can create a wrapper class. This wrapper class will have a handle, and then it will propagate this handle to our useDB and destroyDB method. And it also has the finalizer to destroy the DB in case the dispose method is not called. Unlike the previous example, this one is legit. In pointer is an unmanaged handle, and we really need to have a finalizer here. And here's how we're going to use it. We will create the wrapper, we will use the DB, and we will force the GC collect. And that's it. And here what we can see in the output. First we created the DB, then we started using the DB, but then we destroyed the DB before calling the underlying native API. And the handle is not valid. This probably will cause the application to crash as well. Let's look what's going on under the hood. This code is equivalent to this one. We have a wrapper, and then we call wrapper use RuxDB. And at this point, when we call a wrapper, the instance itself is eligible for the GC. Let's look at this method. The only thing this method does is it takes the handle, copies the value of this handle, and passes this to the native layer. Technically, when we are calling this method, the instance itself is reachable for the GC as well. And so, if during this call, a long-running operation will happen that will cause a GC collection due to a memory pressure and whatnot, the instance that holds the in pointer can be collected by the GC. And in this case, if the two cycles will happen because this operation will take a really long time, and for the database operations, this is not uncommon. The handle itself can be collected by the finalizer, and we could have race condition that the handle might be disposed by a different thread while it's being used by a native code, causing the application to crash or overall an undefined behavior. But instead of manually creating the finalizer and dealing with in pointer directly, we should use safe handle. We can derive from this class and overwrite just a single method to destroy the DB when needed. So instead, we should use RuxDB safe handle everywhere. Our wrapper class is way simpler. We don't need to have the finalizer and the dispose method just call the dispose for the underlying handle. And we are going to use our safe handle in all of our native API. And actually, .NET supports that. We can even use safe handles for our p-invoke methods. So in this case, the runtime will guarantee that during the p-invoke, the handle itself will not be collected by the GC. And now, if we'll run the code again, we'll see that it works as expected. As you can see, we're creating the DB first, we use the DB completely, and only after we're done with the DB, we destroy this by the finalizer. And now, even crazier question. Is it possible for the finalizer to be executed before the construction is done? It means that, is it possible to see destructor end on the screen before constructor end on the screen? And probably, if you reach this point, you should understand that the answer to this question is yes. The constructors are not that different from the GC point of view from any other methods. It means that if the instance fields are not being touched after some point, and the instance itself is not being saved to any variables, it might be eligible for the GC even before the construction is technically fully done. And if we'll force the GC collect during the construction, we will see that indeed the constructor can be finished after the finalization is done. And here you go. And as you can see, the finalizer indeed finished before the construction was done for this instance. The cases I showed here were causing production incidents in the real world and are not theoretical examples that I came up with. Okay, the crazy constructor one is theoretical, but the rest two are not. The main goal of this episode is to scare you and convince that native resource management in .NET is tricky. Every time you see a finalizer, the inner alarm bell should be triggered. Do we really need it? Is it safe? Do we have a better option? Are we touching managed resources from it? You should clearly design the native to manage layer and rely on safe handle instead of manually managing the native resources. If you enjoyed this deep dive, hit that like button, subscribe, and let me know in the comment below which .NET topic you want me to cover next. That's it for today, guys. Thanks for watching, be curious, and see you next time.